Today I'm going to take you to a spot that does not seem very holiday, doesn't seem very light, it's not super fluffy. Um, I'm going to take you to a time, to a, a spot where you have to decide, you have to make a decision. What are you living for? Who are you living for? Perhaps even what is life all about? We're going to be discussing uh, Jesus' third illustration in the parable of the sower, where Jesus very simply said that the sower who's sowing seed, seed being the word of God, the sower being you and me, Jesus perhaps, um, throwing seed out the, into the soil, and the soil is the heart, the human heart, uh, is the condition of the person's soul able to receive the message that a sower goes and broadcasts seed, and the seed falls on different types of soil. There's a hard, trampled down, beaten path uh, of a heart where the, the seed doesn't take root, that the birds, uh, Satan himself and the demons, come and steal the word away, that there is a type of soil that's shallow where there's limestone rock beds below the surface and that the word begins to grow. And as it grows, it doesn't take root because it hits the rocks. And Jesus talked about how the, the rocks were like the trials of life and the difficult times and how sometimes our faith dies because we don't endure. Well, today Jesus is talking about the third type of obstacle to, to true faith, to applying the word. And he says there are three things that hinder us from applying the word, from growing in our faith, from being people of uncommon faith. He said, the worries of life, the deception of wealth, and the preoccupation or the concern for other things. Now, I want to read this to you, and we're going to dive right in. And, and I want to take you to the spot where Jesus was taking the hearers, where he said, the world has a way, you may have a way, which way do you choose? In Matthew 18, 13, 18, Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desire for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Three things that Jesus says are going to be obstacles to you and I applying the word of God to our lives. Number one, the worries of life. Who doesn't have worries of life? I know I certainly do. You probably do as well. Who is going to take care of me? If I'm not looking out for myself, then no one else is going to. I mean, it's me and mine, and it's you and yours, and they and theirs. And I have to look out for, for me and mine. And that's just the way it is. It's the law of the jungle, the natural order of things, the worries of life. Jesus says, if you're concerned about your own life to the point where you're only preoccupied about yourself and ignore others, and your responsibility to the kingdom, then the word of God may not have taken root in your life or your heart. Now, the second thing he says is that you have to be careful about the deceitfulness of wealth. Now, Jesus does not say rich people are bad people. Jesus does not say that he doesn't give money to people to be used for his kingdom. But what Jesus does say over and over and over again is that money is deceitful. And the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. What does deceitful mean? Deceitful means that it lies to you. You ever been lied to? When you are a parent and you have small children, they tell lies, right? And you tell them to tell the truth because the truth will set you free. How many parents have said that to kids? Sometimes the truth will get you grounded, but ultimately it will set you free. We say that to kids. Now, as a child grows a little older, we don't like them lying to us at all because they have consequences that are greater with the decisions they make that are bigger. But then pretty soon when you're an adult and you lie or you're lied to, you erode trust. The foundation of relationships begin to crumble. You ever been lied to by a spouse? by a brother or sister, by a best friend. And you begin to wonder all the things that you've built your relationship on, trust included. They may not be the way you thought they were. You begin to pull some threads or strings that unravels the very fabric of the relationship. And, and Jesus says, be careful with your relationship with money and wealth because it will lie to you. Money will tell you you have to have it for your security that it can solve your problems, that you have to pursue it above all else. And once you get enough, well, then you can go on to other things. So I want us to stop just for a second and talk about this. And I wanna remind you that Jesus is not saying that he does not like 
wealthy people. He's not saying that he does not give wealth to some and perhaps not to others. But if a person has accumulated wealth and they're walking with God, then they are generous. Because a person who accumulates wealth and has chosen to hoard to accumulate more is simply not walking with God in that area of their life. So it's our attitude towards money. And Jesus says it's the deceit that comes and that money can be deceptive, that wealth can be deceptive. Did you know that money oftentimes destroys marriages? That oftentimes it destroys family because the commitment and the desire for a person to pursue the accumulation of money above all else, we call it sacrifice. Well, of course I have to make these sacrifices. I can't be with my wife or my husband as much as I would like to, because after all, I have to accumulate, I have to progress, I have to be promoted, I have to get, I have to, and, and you agree oftentimes. You look at your spouse and you nod your head and say, yes, this is important. So we shall sacrifice, but sacrifice, the sacrifice you can make is only self-sacrifice. You can't sacrifice for anybody else. I can't sacrifice for my wife. I can sacrifice myself for my wife and her to me. So the sacrifices are made and we decide to, to pursue, to accumulate, to gather, to grow our empire. And we don't do the things we need to do to grow our marriage. And pretty soon we find ourselves distant saying that we've accomplished what we wanted to accomplish, but in reality, we've only distanced ourselves to the point where we can't coexist. Money cannot buy back a broken marriage. How many kids look at their dads or their moms and say, boy, they were successful in their career, but I sure wish they'd have spent a little time with me. But how many parents are so tempted to say, Success requires sacrifice. So I'm going to sacrifice for my kids and from my kids. And I may not know them or be part of their lives, but I'll be able to leave with them, perhaps even generational wealth. And I've never met a kid whose father or mother has chosen not to be a part of their lives, who would rather trade what they get monetarily or physically for what they missed emotionally and relationally. Money can't buy back a relationship with your kids. Sometimes the pursuit of money, the obsession with money, with promotion, with accumulation, brings with it deceit involving compromise. And money can't buy back a reputation that's been ruined because we've chosen to do things our way and not God's way. Money can't buy back integrity when we've given up our integrity to gain something that we thought was so important. So you're tracking with me? You see when Jesus kind of puts this in, he almost buries it right in the middle of this list of three. We don't really see it as a gut punch. We just see it sort of as a jab. But in reality, it's like right at the heart of what he's trying to say. And he says, when the word of God is being spread and you understand the principles of the kingdom, you're gonna come to choices in your life and you may or may not make the right choice. I hope you do. But the worries of life, the deceitfulness of wealth and the preoccupation for other things, well, they're gonna be there. Let me take you to a couple Proverbs very quickly. I think you may enjoy them. Now, I'm not trying to step on anybody's toes and I'm not really trying to get into your business, although I hope the Holy Spirit gets into your business because that's what God does so well. As I told you a minute ago, I wanna take you to a place where you have to choose for yourself. Because after all, God's trustworthy, right? So if you trust him with your salvation and you trust him with your eternity, shouldn't it logically follow that we can trust him with our career and with our family? Shouldn't it logically follow that if our priorities are biblical and our principles steadfast coming from the word of God, that God can provide the promotions and the success that he thinks that we need. Now, let me take you to these things because they're really interesting. Here we go. In Proverbs 30, seven through nine, the wisest man in the world and the richest guy in the world at this point. 
I mean, this is like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and everybody else you can think of. I'd have said Donald Trump, but half of you would have laughed and half of you would have shaken your heads. We're not going there. Rich people, richest person you've ever met, the richest person you've ever met and the wisest person you've ever met. If somebody who's rich and wise says, hey, I'm gonna give you a piece of advice. These are the prayers of my life. You would listen up. I would listen up. So let's listen up. This is what we read. Oh God, I beg two favors from you. First, help me never tell a lie. I don't want to be part of the deceit. Help me tell the truth. And by the way, telling the truth is not just saying everything that you think is true. There's wisdom and it comes with choosing what to say, but telling the truth is making sure the things that come out of our mouth are true. And Solomon says, I pray God, let me never tell a lie. Give me the wisdom to know what not to say and make sure everything I say is true. These last two weeks, I had some time to spend with my boys, both of them driven, both of them trying to take over the world in their own way. And as much as I was able, as a dad can, because if you say too much, your kids don't listen to you, right, parents? If you're a kid in here, like say 30 and under, your parents are old enough now to where they've made some mistakes. They've seen some things that we wish we could have done differently. They've had friends who've done some things that they've seen or maybe been a part of that they wish they could have ended up differently. And sometimes when we tell you things, we do it because we love you and we want to tell you the truth. And I told my boys, the world is lying to you. Your time in life right now is not all about accomplishment and accumulation. I have a son who's a father now. Your responsibility is to that little girl and to your wife. Now, first of all, it's to the Lord. And if you serve the Lord and your wife and your daughter, God is going to give you the success that he wants to give you. You can trust him. Now, I said it in different ways, but I said it at multiple times because I want to tell the truth. And as a dad, I would be lying to him if I said your job is to get a job. Your job is to be a millionaire. Your job is to be successful. Your job is to own a huge house. Your job is to accumulate everything you can accumulate. I would be lying to him because as a man or woman of God, God provides the blessings. We provide the obedience. So that's what he says. He says, first of all, help me never tell a lie. Second, this is a hard one. This is tough. Let's all take a deep breath. Can you pray it? I haven't read it to you yet. Maybe you've read ahead. This is a struggle for me. Second, give me neither poverty nor riches. Give me just enough to satisfy my needs. And I don't want you to immediately assume that's poverty because sometimes God gives material blessing so that our need to be generous can be satisfied. But give me just enough to satisfy my needs. And so I ask this question when I'm reading this, this proverb, I'm like, how much is enough? And the Bible answers this question because maybe you ask the same question. How much is enough? How many of us have had the illusion, the deception? Have we believed the lie? Just a little more is enough. Here's what I have, but as soon as I get, or when I, or after I, and we lie to ourselves, we deceive ourselves because the when, the if, the after, the then never happens. It's like the carrot we can never catch. If I grow rich, I might deny you and say, who is the Lord? I got lots. And the deception is we think God needs us because we're willing to toss out a little cash every once in a while. And we call it a blessing. And the wisest man in the world and the richest man in the world says, when we're rich, the temptation is to deny you and say, who is the Lord? But if we don't have enough, then we're preoccupied with the basic things of life and we may steal and thus 
insult God's holy name. And so Jesus, in the third application of this parable, of the parable of the soil, he said, the sower broadcasts the seed, the word of God. And there are many people who hear it and go, that sounds great. Until we begin to understand. And with every level of understanding comes a choice. There's a left and there's a right. And in this parable, Jesus says some people are overwhelmed with the choice and they see the worries of this world and they say, I'm the only trustworthy person I can think of. The deception of wealth and we buy into the lie. And just the simple desire for other things because friends, the world is full of options. There's just only one true option. And Jesus says, some are gonna dive in and say, yep. And then they're gonna say, nope. And then they're gonna walk away. And he says, but some grab the word, even though it's tough and begin to grow. And when the hard decisions come, and it's not too late, friends, what happened yesterday is yesterday. We're talking about today and tomorrow. When the hard decisions come, we apply the word and we grow and we become a plant that yields 10, 20, 30, 50, 100, 200 times what anyone else imagines or expects. So I'm sort of sorry, not sorry, that I'm taking you to a tough spot like this on a holiday weekend, but we're in a series and this is where we are in the series and you guys can handle it because after all, you got a day off tomorrow. So you're gonna digest it, you're gonna internalize it and then you're gonna choose. And the great thing about this is only you can see your heart and only you can answer this question. Are you willing to live for Jesus? Or is it Jesus and a whole lot of other stuff? So as we continue, I just wanna make sure that I remind you that my intention is not to fill you with guilt or regret or shame for maybe not making these decisions correctly and there are things in your life you probably would wanna do over again. Um, if you've lived any years at all, there's always things we would like to do over again. And I wanna just remind you that regret can be a powerful motivator. And so if you feel any regret about decisions perhaps you've made or sacrifices you've chosen to make at somebody else's expense, allow that to motivate you to correctly apply God's word as we all try to do this together and live a different way. Because as I mentioned, it's not about yesterday or last week or last month or last year. It's about what you do today and how we go into tomorrow. It's why we do what we do on Sunday mornings. So regret can be a powerful motivator. And I just want you to live with this word in mind because I understand the things I'm talking about make some of you very skeptical. I want you to live with the word perhaps in mind. Because for some of you, you're saying it's impossible, you're out of touch, you're a preacher, what do you know? I just want you to live with the idea that perhaps what I'm saying is true and perhaps since you trust God with your eternity, you could trust him with everything else. Allow for that crack or that window into your life and see what God does as he proves it to you. We're gonna look at the example of King David before he was king, as he was led up to a decision, a deciding point where he faced the worries of the world, the deceitfulness of riches and the idea that maybe other things would be really nice to have. It was a time after he had been anointed by, well, the prophet who came and said, that's the one I want, the scruffy one that was off with the sheep. He's gonna be the next king. He ended up serving Saul as a musician. He killed God. Goliath. After he killed Goliath, he became a general in Saul's army and, and military victories were just too many to count. There were people singing songs about him. That's what they did back in the day. And then Saul got jealous. King Saul, he was a bit crazy. Well, he was a lot crazy and got jealous of David and decided that because people loved him, God's hand was on him and he was going to take over the throne. He was going to kill David. And so he literally began to chase David from little town to little town as David hid in places you wouldn't wanna live in or wouldn't even wanna stay in for long periods of time. Saul found out that David was hiding out in the cave of the goats 
And Saul got 3,000 people together to form a posse to go and kill one man. Now, David had gathered together a handful of merry men, not mighty men at this point, but merry men who were the scruffy outlaw, um, really misfit, no, no place to live. They knew David was running. They were running. They didn't really have anything else to do. So they just sort of gathered around him and said, we're not sure about all this God stuff. Not all of them, most of them, but we do like you. We think something cool is going on here. So we're going to just run with you and hang out. Now, David found out that Saul was coming with 3,000 men. And the area that David had to hide, it wasn't you know, like it was the United States. I mean, we're talking about a small geographic area. And so David told his little band of misfit men that would later become the mighty men, break up into small groups of two or three and hide. Hide anywhere you can. So when Saul walks by with his army, they just think you're hanging out and um, they'll leave you alone. And so David and a few of his friends took off into a cave and hid out to wait for the trouble to pass. Now, you've heard this story from me before in the fall, and we'll come back from time to time to important stories in scripture, but I don't know many stories that apply this principle of a deciding moment of the temptation to take what you think you need now and not wait on God for God's plan. There are not many stories better than this one. So David and his men were hiding out in the cave and Saul, well, nature called. You say, well, what do you mean? He had to go number two, which happens then just like now. They didn't have any port johns They didn't have any public facilities. You had to find some place with privacy and um, a locked door. And so Saul went into the cave. Now the tension is that it's the same cave that David and his friends were hiding in. Now, can you imagine you're walking in Middle East, you know, the sun's in your eyes and you walk into a dark place, you can't see very well. And um, you don't really know David's in there with a few friends. So he throws off his outer robe, Saul tosses it off, goes over to a nice spot, squats down, pulls out his iPhone, starts checking his mail, <laughs> catching up on a chapter of a book he's been wanting to read. I don't know, whatever you guys do when you're indisposed. I had so many different ideas, so many different titles I wanted to call this sermon. The decision of the dookie, that was one. And my wife says, you can't say dookie in church, that's irreverent. So. Um, the parable of the Pope, the chronicle of the, well, never mind. Uh, there were all sorts of, all sorts of things I wanted to call it. Couldn't call it any, but this is really happening. It's in the Bible for goodness sakes. And so, um, David's friends who were new at walking with God, well, they weren't walking with God, new at walking with David. They're like, can you believe this? How more indisposed can you get? How more vulnerable can you get? Clothes off, squatted in a corner, doing number two. So Saul was a sitting duck. And David's friends said, jackpot. Well, I'm going to read it to you. <laughs> the men said, this is the day that God is giving you Saul into our hands. You can deal with him as you wish. Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Now the Bible says David was conscience stricken later and, and he gave a sort of a mini lecture to his friends and he said, I'm never gonna do this. I'm not gonna touch Saul. Don't lay a hand on someone anointed by God. By the way, have you heard that saying before? Thou shalt not touch the Lord's anointed. Some pastors, they misuse this scripture to try to protect themselves from attack from people. And they say, I'm God's anointed. Don't you say anything against me. Um, some people say it's believers and that how nothing bad should happen to a believer because we're all God's anointed. When this is used, it's only used twice in scripture that no one can touch God's anointed. It's talking about the founders of our faith, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, talking about how God protected them and allowed the nation of Israel to come into being and God's plan to be executed throughout history. So anybody else that uses that in any other way is not right. Now, don't attack pastors for no reason. It's not nice. 
But if they use that scripture to defend themselves, say, "Uh uh-uh, study your Bible, and then you may fight some more. I don't know. But that's what David said. He goes, "I I cannot get in the way of God's plan, even though it makes sense. Now, here's the way that this is constructed. The language is constructed. That his friends said, kill him. There he is, back to you, squatting down as indisposed as indisposed can be. So David, in the back of the cave, decides in his mind, yes, I will, this is good. And he takes off across the cave. Who who knows, 20 feet? I don't know. And by the time he gets there, he decides not to do it. And everything in his life was different because of that decision. In a moment, in a flash, he decided the worries of life, the deceit of wealth, wealth, the desire for other things, everything that could have been potentially satisfied in this one decision, he chose God's way. And I think there were some reasons some applications that you and I can put into our own lives to make sure we choose the same way. And let's look at these together because I think they're really, really important. One, David realized that private decisions are public decisions, that every decision you make always affects somebody else. Is that true? Every decision that you make in your life always affects the people around you. They may not see it immediately, but it affects, it has awake the people who are around you. For David, a decision made in the cave in the middle of nowhere would have affected an entire nation and ultimately you and I. For you, the decisions that you think you are making in private, perhaps compromises, perhaps disguised as sacrifices, they affect the people around you and your place in God's plan. And I think David remembered that, that there's no such thing as just a personal decision, that they're always public and it always affects somebody else. Now, our friends make a difference. How about that one? David's friends lied to him. Now, they didn't mean to, but they said, this is God's will. This is God's plan. The people that we choose to spend our time with, well, it's really important Research shows that the five people you spend most of your time with are the people you're going to become like. For those who are introverts, maybe it's three people, maybe two. But who in your friend group would you hand a pen to and ask them to write the next chapter of your life? When you begin to populate that list, then perhaps you have the right people around you. And there should be people around you who would be populating your list and also people who you are around who would choose you to populate theirs. I remember one of the most successful people I've known. His name was Dave. He was an executive high, high level executive. Well, I can't probably tell you the company, but you've flown in the airplanes they make a lot. And when we talked, this was some years ago, he told me, and he was serving the church every week, he said, God's given me the success that he's given me. And I haven't always made the right decisions in my career and my life but I saw what it was doing to my wife and family. And he said, I decided I was gonna do things God's way. And if God chose to bless me, he would bless me. And if he didn't, I was okay staying where I was. And he had risen to the top level in a huge, huge multinational company. You know, I ask you to say the word perhaps in your mind because I just want you to allow the window of perhaps. This is the story of Dave. He said, church is important to me. So I've arranged my travel schedule to where if I'm in the Middle East on Tuesday, I'm back on Sunday. And he said, I've decided that if I can't work my travel schedule out to accommodate my commitment to my church, that I'm not going to travel. And he said, I'm busy, but he said, I served me as a pastor, which was a very humbling thing for him to say. And he said, if you ever need me, 
He said, I want you to call me on my cell phone. And he said, whatever I'm doing, I'm going to stop and I'm going to talk to you. But he said, only call me if you need me, because obviously it was a huge privilege or opportunity. And in the years I worked with him, he continued to rise in the company, but continued to keep his commitments to the Lord, his family, and the church every single week. And he said, at the moment I have to compromise, I'm done because I know what I'm going to walk away from. And it's not my faith. Now you can say it can't happen, but I'm asking you to say perhaps because I've seen it and I'm proud to call him my friend because that's what I want to be like. I could give him a pen and say, write the next chapter of my life. And I would trust this man to write it because he lived it. Some would say recklessly, but Dave simply said, God put me here, he can keep me here. And if he doesn't, that's okay. Interesting. Our friends make a difference. Advanced decisions are always the best, right? David hadn't made an advanced decision because he was in the moment. All of a sudden he had an opportunity to dispatch his enemy. Remember Joseph, and I think it's Genesis 39. Don't look it up right now and tell me I'm wrong. It's very disconcerting for a pastor. Look it up later, email me, tell me I'm wrong. Genesis 39, Joseph and Potiphar's wife, when Mrs. Potiphar propositioned Joseph and said, hey, come to bed with me. And he's like, no, thanks. Well, she propositioned him a bunch and he had had a speech in mind. And finally, when she propositioned him, he said, no, Mrs. Potiphar, your husband has given me everything except you. I serve him, I serve the Lord, I will not and um, ended up accused of rape and thrown into prison. You know how the story goes, but he had decided in advance. David hadn't been able to decide in advance. He just knew he was going to apply God's law in advance. And so he was in the moment on his way from the back of the cave to the decision he was going to make. And God spoke to him. Uh, and I just want to remind you that in this story, I see, and in following God's word and God's law, I see that when there is a tension in our lives, that we need to pay attention in our life. When you have a tension in a decision or an event, a proposition, we need to pay attention because that's how the Holy Spirit speaks to us. Remember Brandon last week talking to you about walking in step with the Spirit and living in the realm of the Spirit? My mom growing up, she used to say something that um, sounded very mystical to me, but now I get it. She's probably watching this morning, so I appreciate you saying it, Mom. Um, she would say, I have a check in my spirit. You ever heard that? Anybody say that? I just got a check in my spirit about it. And at first I'm like, well, what's it, how much was the check for? I mean, I didn't know what that meant, right? Explain to me this check you have in your spirit. No one can really explain it. They just got it, right? We call it a red flag. We call it a pay attention when there's a tension because David, I'm doing it. My friends say, yes, I can get what God wants. I can be free of the worries of this life. I can have all the wealth that I need. My future is secure. And in however many steps it took from A to, to B, he had changed his mind because there was a tension. I walk my dog, Daisy. I have a standard poodle and I'm getting over the embarrassment of that. Oh, you feel me that at least there, Pastor Dan. Um, Daisy is supposed to be the smartest dog breed. Well, the second smartest dog breed, thanks. I'm not supposed to walk off camera uh, in the world. And um, there, Daisy, I don't think is that smart. I just think she's judgmental and entitled. But we walk, and when we walk in our neighborhood, we live in the mean streets of, of Prairie Trail. Somehow she um, uh, has a passion in life to eradicate the presence of rabbits in anybody's bushes. That's what Daisy does. And so I usually walk on the sidewalk or the street, and Daisy has a 25 foot leash, and the leash is, you know, and she's up here. I'm walking, she's up in people's bushes, she's running down the bushes, and she's sniffing, sniffing, sniffing. People will come out and go, hey, your dog's in my yard. And I'm like, no, she's just taking care of your bunny problem. You don't need to compensate her, it's just fine. It's her passion in, in life. But the problem is there are obstacles in the way. There are trees in people's yards, there's bushes, there are little decorative lights and things. And, and when Daisy was young, she would just run and the leash stretched 25 feet. She would run into everything and I would yell at her, Daisy, and I would pull. And if you see, there's a bungee cord here, it's because she's almost 60 pounds. And when she runs to the end of the leash after a rabbit, I mean, it's like, bam, and it'd pull your shoulder out of joint, it's bad news. And so I would say, Daisy, Daisy, no, no, she's older now, two and a half, wiser, maybe a little less energy. And I've said the same thing to her since she was a baby. Daisy, pay attention. Daisy, pay attention. 
and I give the leash a little jerk, right? Which is what you and I both need. The Holy Spirit sometimes just gives that little leash a jerk. And it's 25 feet. God gives us a lot of latitude to make our own decisions, but we're in the moment. Pay attention, pay attention. There's an obstacle. At first, she was brand new like David's friends. She would run into the obstacle, tie her leash around trees. I'd have to, it was embarrassing when you're in a yard and you're trying to walk around the tree to untie the leash. She's walking the other way and you want to kick her, but you can't do that because Christians don't kick dogs. Um, but then as she grows a little older, I'd say, pay attention. I'd give her a little jerk on the leash, just a little tug. And she'd look at the obstacle and she'd be like, oh, and she poodle prances around. Um, she prances. She'd go around the obstacles. And now on a good day, all I have to do is say, Daisy, pay attention. And she realizes there's a tension, there's a problem, there's something going on. She's learned, she looks, and she'll go around it. And then right back to her rabbit hunting ways. So many of us have gotten so good at ignoring the tension in our spirit. Once we decide we're making a decision, we're doing it no matter what. And we find, surprisingly, that God always agrees with us. When in reality, in my experience, oftentimes my first instinct is the wrong instinct. And anytime I think God always agrees with me, I think I've reversed the relationship and put myself in his chair. So when you have attention in your life, pay attention to that. And I believe that David answered this question correctly. So I ask it to you. What do you really want in life? What did David want? He wanted the pain to end. He wanted to stop running. He wanted his friends to have a home. He wanted to go back to his family. Maybe to see God's promise fulfilled. Um, what did he want? What did his friends want? Well, they wanted to get rich. They wanted to stop running from the law. They wanted to be able to be the right hand of the king. But David, he went beyond that or past that. And somehow in the moment of sprinting across a cave with a knife in his hand, he asked and answered the question, what does God want from me in this moment? You know, there were songs that were sung about David. We sing songs about each other. Well, we don't sing them, but we talk about them at our funeral. The eulogies, things people say about someone's life after they're gone. What are the songs you want sung about you? Can you imagine had David chosen to take God's will into his own hands and kill Saul? I mean, what children years later would be like, dad, tell us the time when you stabbed the guy while he was doing number two. No one's going to want to hear those kinds of stories. Think of the songs. You couldn't even sing them among polite company. What are the songs you want sung about you? Well, I never really saw my dad because he worked all the time. And when he came home, he drank too much. But you know what? He left me some cash. And so we're cool. Is that the song? Well, my wife and I started off great, but I decided, we decided sacrifice was in order. We needed to achieve. And so we went our own directions and you know, we didn't make it, but that's okay. Things happen. Is that the song? What songs do we want sung about us by our kids, by the people left after we're gone? What does God want? I want the song sung about me like I sing about Dave. You know, Dave, probably one of the most powerful people I've ever known personally, like personal friends. When he picked me up from the airport, he would not let me carry my own suitcase. And I'm stronger than him. I said, Dave, I can carry the suitcase. And he said, nope, I'm a servant. It's what I do. I'm gonna carry your suitcase. I can sing a song about him because I've seen the way he lives. I've seen that he's allowed the word perhaps to become of course, to risk what most people would love to have in life and compromise family, integrity, relationship for. Watched him do it the right way. That's the kind of song that I want to have sung about me and maybe about you as well. Now here's some extra credit. This is too good just to pass up. When David began to feel the same way about Saul as God felt about Saul, his decisions became a little easier. Now, David hated Saul's guts. I know I'm, uh, we're, we're almost out of here, okay? You guys have been exceptionally patient. Don't miss this point. Just a bonus point. 
Something that when I heard this and I connected some dots from another sermon that I listened to, totally different context, but just, uh, it just landed on me so powerfully. Saul had every reason to be hated by David. Saul was trying to destroy David, to try to, to wipe him and the people he cared about off the face of the earth. Saul hated David's guts. He lied about him. He was deceptive. He was murderous. He had every reason for David to absolutely hate him and want him to suffer. And Saul died, by the way. After the story unfolds, we see David cutting off a piece of the robe. Uh, we see David, and he may be not his best moment, go outside. And he's like, hey, I got the piece of your robe, Saul. Could have got you. And Saul's like, thanks for not killing me, but I'm still coming after you. That's sort of a paraphrase. And, and then a little while later, not too many chapters, Saul dies. He dies. And he doesn't die in a great, heroic sort of a way. Some Philistine archer shooting arrows randomly into a group of people, laying down some cover fire. One of them supernaturally, coincidentally, finds a chink in the armor of Saul, pierces him in a mortal way where he's dying. He looks at his arm bearer, his, his sword bearer, cup bearer, one of the bearers that's next to him and goes, hey, kill me. He's like, I'm not killing you. You're the king. And um, he ends up dying a, a coward's death in a way where many people would have been tempted to say he got what he deserved. Mess with me, God's going to get you. But David didn't do that. Because when we think God hates the same people we do, we've successfully put God in a box. We've created him in our own image. David didn't do that. And in your notes, you see the scripture. I'm not making this up. I know it's too much to read behind me as we go. David wrote a song about Saul and about Jonathan and revered and respected the good things that he could and honored him as best he was able because it's what God wanted. Because he began to think about Saul the same way that God thought about him. Who's your worst enemy? The person you hate the most. Do you think about them in the same way your heavenly father thinks about them? Maybe the person you hate the most is yourself. Do you think about yourself in the way your heavenly father thinks about you? It is a game changer because your heavenly father is not an angry, smiting, smoting, brooding God looking for a chance to trip you up and destroy you. He's redemptive and full of grace, offering peace and joy, a freedom beyond comprehension and the promise of heaven. And he's offering that for me and he's offering that for the person who you hate the most. So maybe like David, we can begin to look at the people in our lives that are the most difficult, the same way our heavenly father looks at them. Well, we see David going through Saul's death and then the people, and this is the end of the story. You'll be thankful. You can go on to your golf, your lake, your dinner, whatever you're going on to, your cookout, the people, the children of Israel, they're like, you know, after all, David, you've been a pretty good guy and we know you've won most of the military victories um, people like you even better than Saul. We don't really like him that much. So we took a vote and you're now the king. And so David finally got everything God had promised. But do you understand how the story was different when God gave it to him? From the temptation to sacrifice and compromise. The choice to obey God's word and God's law and the blessing that came when God did it his way. And the time that you and I spent for so many weeks studying the life of King David is because he made decisions like this. And because you and I, well, we need to make these same decisions. So be careful. Be careful of the three things Jesus warns about. The worries of this life, because God's got you. The deception of wealth, because he gives wealth and he doesn't hate rich people, but he expects great generosity. Be careful of the deception. Be careful of entertaining all the other options because there's really only one. And if you do, and you allow the word of God to grow, to take root, your life will be more fruitful than you've ever imagined. And the song sung about you, my friend, will be worth repeating for generations to come. Father, thank you so much for the time we've spent together. And I pray that as we consider these things, I know that many people hear and think it's impossible, impractical, 
perhaps a different era, a different time, but not in the world we live in. But this word, perhaps, it's a word that creates a little tension that requires attention. Requires us putting the the people in our lives who we would trust to write the next chapter. Requires us to make decisions now as to who we are going to be and how we are going to be men and women of God. And I pray that we together would have the courage to not be so saddled with regret that we are paralyzed to move forward, but that we allow regret to be a motivator to propel us into today and tomorrow, together making these decisions the right way, living this life of uncommon faith. Nothing could be more different than the world around us. But that's what Jesus promised from the very first time. He gave his very first teaching on the kingdom of God. So we're in. Help us. We need you. We can't do it ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen.